And we'll dig into the Word. Heavenly Father, we thank You. We praise You. We love You, Lord. You are indeed a great and awesome God. And Lord, as we go to Your Word now, we ask that Your Holy Spirit would be our teacher. Lord, we know the words and the opinions of man are just a waste of time. So less of, less of man, more of Your Spirit. Give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said... One last thing, I met with a pastor from East Africa. I had breakfast with him on Friday. He's planted 12 churches in East Africa and uh, was really blessed by him. And we're praying, he, they asked if I would come out in January and teach inductive Bible study to the pastors out there. So Lord willing, I'm going to do that. But I'd also like for us as a church to adopt one of those 12 churches. You know, all these guys are struggling. They're out in the middle of nowhere and, and we have so much. We're so abundantly blessed. Can I get an amen to that? And just... I would love to adopt one of those churches, pray for their pastors, uh, help support them financially, send teams out to see them. So just keep that in prayer. And I love church plants. This guy's planted 12 churches. He and I became friends really quick because I love that and so does he. So praise the Lord for that. All right, Galatians. So we've been talking about this. This is an exhortive letter written by the Apostle Paul to the churches in the region of Galatia. It wasn't just one church. It was many churches. And he, he exhorts them, and his heart is broken for them because they had so quickly turned away from the truth to another gospel. It says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 8, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble and want to uh, trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached to you, let him be accursed or anathema. He writes this letter because his heart is broken that these people who've made professions of Christ, who, who understood and knew the gospel, have fallen into the trap of, adding, of listening to those who are adding to the gospel, and they begin to believe what they are teaching. Guys, it's no different today. We're living in a, a, a time when the church in America has become pretty lukewarm. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. And the church as a whole is easily chasing after the latest wind of doctrine, the latest book that's been written. What's the fresh word that comes from God? Guys, we need a fresh word. We need to just get faithful to the word he already gave us. Can I get an amen to that? We need to read the Bible. We need to study the Word of God. We need to be diligent to teach the whole counsel of God. We need not to compromise God's Word. And heaven forbid we should never add to it or take away from it. All the cults today, that's what they've done. You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses have the watchtower, and they say it's equivalent to the Word of God. You have the Mormons who have another gospel to Jesus Christ. He doesn't need another gospel. Amen? And when you add to the word of God, you are preaching a false gospel. And guys, there's nothing new under the sun because the church in Galatia, you know, it's less than, you know, it's a short amount of time since the church was even founded and already they're being drawn away. And sometimes when we're drawn away, we don't typically get drawn away because somebody shows up at our doorstep and says, I'm here to preach another gospel. You chase them off your property. You know, what they do instead is they, they say they're going to illuminate the truth that we already have. They're going to make us understand it in a more clear way. And that's what was happening in Galatia because the Judaizers were coming in and saying, yes, Jesus died on the cross. Yes, he rose from the dead. But you know that you need to be circumcised as well. And you know that you need to keep the law as well. And today you'll have some that will come and say, you need to be baptized in our baptismal, or you have to take our class, or you have to, you know, have the, you have to observe Passover. And when guys, when we add to the cross of Calvary, we are denying what Jesus said on the cross when he said, it is finished. Amen? Amen. So guys, be careful. And they'll come disguised in ways that it seems like we're looking for deeper truth when what we're really doing is walking away from the truth. And be careful, be careful, be careful. We need to know what the Word of God says. We need to study it. In Galatians 2, he said, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. For by works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. Guys, we're not saved by good works. Amen? Amen. If good works could save us, Jesus would not have had to die on the cross. So it's, we're saved by faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I know there's a it's hard sometimes to put the two things together because the Bible also says in James that faith without works is dead. So is it faith or is it works? Or is it faith plus works? No, it's faith that works. Amen? Because when we walk in faith, there will be fruit. There will, but it always begins with faith in Christ, with belief in Him. Amen? 
That's the beginning. We don't do good works so we find favor with God. We find favor with God by faith, and then that produces good works. And guys, it, it may seem like semantics, but when you get those out of order, one is salvation is a free gift, and the other one is salvation is a paycheck. I earned it. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. Later in chapter 2, he said, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We were crucified with Christ. See, the reason we're going to heaven is not because we checked a bunch of boxes of good works. We're going to heaven because Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the dead. And when we gave our life to him, we died to the person we used to be. We've been crucified with Christ. We've been made new creations by him. We've been adopted into his family we've been filled with his holy spirit we have the promise of eternal life our name's written in the lamb's book of life that's why we're going to heaven not because we did a bunch of do 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 and do this amen it's not do and do it's done and then galatians 2 21 says if righteousness comes to the law then christ died in vain so we need to be very careful not to add to the cross of calvary not to become legalistic Again, if the Holy Spirit convicts us of things, should we obey it? What's the answer? Always. But when I make a personal conviction, a prerequisite for your salvation, I just became a legalist. Amen? If I make it a prerequisite for my own salvation, I became a legalist. And so the legalist always thinks he or she is the more spiritual one. I keep more rules than you. I'm closer to God. And the reality is that when, the closer we get to God, the more we recognize how we can't keep more rules. Amen? The law cannot save us. The law is a taskmaster that leads us to the cross. So last week, we looked at justification by faith. There's only one way you and I can be justified. It is through Jesus Christ alone. We saw that faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And faith is only as good as the object you place your faith in. Guys, the word faith gets thrown around a lot. People will use the term, I'm spiritual. Oh, you're a pastor, I'm spiritual. And I say, what does that mean? Can you help me out with that? You volunteered your spiritual. Can you define that for me? You define your spirituality and then I'll define mine. Can we get an amen to that? You're spiritual. I'm on a journey. Dude, we're not on a journey. Amen? That's very popular in churches today. How is your journey going? I've already arrived with Christ. Can I get an amen to that? I already know who I am in Christ. I'm not earning my way. I'm not following the yellow brick road. Can I get an amen to that? I'm not on a journey. I have a relationship with Almighty God. He's adopted me into his family. I found my forever home. Can I get an amen to that? And that's the reality. And the world we live in today is so caught up in earning it and the things I must do to achieve it when Christ already did it on the cross. And I know it's hard to understand, but yes, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Does he command us to do that? And we should, amen? And he calls us to live a life of obedience. But obedience doesn't save us. Obedience is only possible once we've been saved. Amen? So guys, we we can't put the cart before the horse. Nothing comes before salvation. Salvation, justification, just as if I've never sinned, is what transforms me into a new creation. But you know what? Faith is not only necessary and is not the source, not only of salvation, it's the source of sanctification. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. See, some people think, well, yeah, it's faith to get justified, and now I have to do all the works to be sanctified. Now, remember, justified, just as if I never sinned, we've been justified. We're being sanctified. The word sanctification, again, means being set apart unto the Lord. Until the day we were glorified, that won't happen until we get to heaven. So we're all in the sanctification process, and we can fall into the trap of saying, well, yeah, I know I had to be, it was all faith that justified me, but now it's my good works that sanctify me. Uh, Once again, you can't do it apart from the Lord, amen? Apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, apart from the empowering of the Holy Spirit, apart from faith in Jesus Christ, we can't do it. A question that pertains not only to our salvation, again, how how we receive forgiveness, but how we enter into an eternal relationship with Almighty God. It's not by faith or by works. Is it by faith or by works? Is it by grace or by the law? The same questions apply again to our daily sanctification. Here's the reality. If you're struggling in your walk, it's not because you're not trying hard enough. 
It's because you're not desperate enough for the Lord. You're not walking by faith. You're not seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things are added unto you. Amen? It's faith in him. It's not, it's not buckling down and trying harder. It's not pulling up your bootstraps and doing better. It's not writing down 50 things that I'm going to keep, but I'm determined to do it because when we do it in our own strength, we will fail every time. It's learning to be in a place where you are walking in intimate fellowship with God. See, good works do not produce intimate fellowship. Intimate fellowship produces good works. If you have an intimate relationship with the Lord, if he's your best friend, if, if he's your Lord, your God, your Savior, and your King, if you wake up in the morning thinking about him, if you spend your day in his presence, if you hunger for his word, if you're walking in the power of his spirit, guess what? Fruit's going to follow. Amen. Amen? It's going to be borne out in your life. And we want to produce fruit so we can be closer to God. We can only produce fruit if you're closer to God. Amen? You pursue him and he'll take care of the rest. So grab your outline. We're going to look at the first 14 verses this morning. And I tell the message by faith or by works. Now this is talking about the sanctification process. We've already talked about being justified. We'll, we'll hit on it a little bit in the text. But mainly this is talking about how do I live a more holy life? How many of you guys want to live a more holy life? I can both my hand, put a foot up on that one. Amen. I mean, I, I want to live a more holy life. I want to live my life in the center of God's will. And it's not by me sitting down and writing down a list of things I'm going to try to do better. It's by me just saying, Lord, I'm going to make you the priority and passion of my life. I'm going to love and serve you above all else. You come first in my life. You guys have all heard my life's verses, Philippians 1.21, which is for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. You know, that doesn't mean he's number one on the list. It means he is the list. Amen. For me to live is Christ. He's first. He's 10th. He's 50th. He's every number in between. Christ is the list. I don't just put Christ first. He's the whole list of my whole life. And you know what? When you make him the priority and the list of your life, you become a better man, a better woman, a better husband, a better wife, a better father, a better, a better mother, better grandparents, a better employee. Amen. Pursue God. That's where, it, that's where it starts. It's where it begins. And truthfully, it's where it ends. So we're first going to see just two things, two points with a lot of subpoints on there. The fruits of faith. The fruits of faith. We're going to see in nine verses that because of faith, we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. As we walk in faith, we see God do the miraculous. We're going to see it was by faith that we were saved. Do you know that Abraham was saved by faith almost 500 years before the law existed? Think about that. He was saved by faith, and there was no law yet. Now, the law is written on our heart to some degree, but the Ten Commandments, Moses comes way after Abraham. Amen? And that understanding helps us to understand that he was saved apart from the law. So why would we try to be saved through the law? Amen? So we're going to see that the fruits of faith include salvation. Also, good works. Again, the power to live a holy and set-apart life. The fruit and faith of salvation, not the source of faith and salvation. And then finally, the blessing of God comes from a life of faith. Now, not the kind of blessing of God you see on, you know, uh, grab it and blab it television. Can I get an amen to that? Name it and claim it, grab it and blab it, believe it and achieve it. Cadillac, Cadillac, Cadillac. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about this nonsense that we see and people, you got to have faith. You just have faith and you can just move a mountain and you can get a Cadillac. Let's stop it. The blessings that God has for us are not temporal, they're eternal. Amen? If you, want, if you want the fruit of your salvation to be a Cadillac, you can have it. I want Jesus. I want, I want to live my life sold out and set apart for Him. I want to be filled with His Holy Spirit. I want to use the spiritual gifts He's given me, the spiritual gifts He's given you, and use them for His kingdom and for His glory. I want my life to count for eternity. How about you? And those are the blessings he pours out upon us as we walk by faith. I found this to be true. As we walk by faith, we want to serve more. Can I get an amen to that? As we walk by faith, we share our faith more. As we walk by faith, we're kinder and more loving to people. We love God and we love people. Amen? And I found that the opposite is also true because once we start serving more, we start growing more. Amen? Once we get out of our comfort zone, it's amazing. The more we allow God to do a work in our lives, the more the Lord does works through our lives. Amen? So we're going to see the fruits of faith, and then we're going to see the curse of the law. Now, the law, praise God for the law. Did God give us the law for a reason? What's the answer? 
Absolutely. And praise God for the law and praise God for the guidelines that we get to live a holy life from the law. But again, the law doesn't save us. And if you want the law to be your source of salvation, because the law cannot save, and those who choose the law as their means of right standing before the Lord are under the curse of the law, because if you choose the law, you must always have kept the law and you must always keep the law for the rest of your life. How many of you guys have done that so far? How many of you guys are still... Yeah, not so much. And if your hand's up, now you're prideful and you're lying, so now you broke some more. Can I get an amen? <laughs> but the reality is that we fall into the trap. The Bible says the law is a schoolmaster, a taskmaster that leads us to the cross. See, what the law does is it makes us all realize I'm a sinner. When I share my faith with people, the first thing I do is I take them to the law. If we start having a conversation, uh, especially on flights and stuff like that where I have a captive audience, I get the aisle seat. Where are you going, bro? You're in the, you know... You're by the window. You can't leave, okay? <laughs> but the reality is that as you share your faith, the first thing that we need to see, we need to recognize we're sinners before we'll see our need for a Savior. And the law reveals that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. Can we get an amen? So let's begin there looking at by faith or by works. And we are going to first look at the fruits of faith. The things that come from having faith in the Lord, these are the fruits that faith produces. And the first thing we're, we're, that we're going to see is the empowering of the Holy Spirit. And praise God for the Holy Spirit. Can I get an amen to that? And his, does he get abused sometimes? Do people attribute things to the Holy Spirit that he had nothing to do with? Can I get an amen to that? Oh, the Spirit told me. No, he didn't. The Word of God is where we check, again, the works of the Holy Spirit. Look what it says there in verse 1. And you got to love Paul. Oh, foolish Galatians. Is our brother Paul direct or what? The word foolish there in the Greek describes not stupidity, but mental laziness and a lack of spiritual discernment. Guys, this is rampant in the church today. He's not saying they're dumb. He's saying they're lazy. And he's saying you lack discernment. Some guy came into your church and started preaching a false gospel and you bought it. My prayer would be that if I got hit by a bus and somebody came in here and started teaching and he was teaching a lie, you'd all recognize it in 30 seconds. Can I get an amen to that? And the only reason you're going to recognize the counterfeit is if you know the truth. The truth will set you free. Can I get an amen to that? Because it truly does. And he says, you foolish Galatians. What are you thinking? How are you falling for these lies? I know you've been taught the truth, Paul could say, because I taught you the truth. And I know that the Holy Spirit, you've had the gift of the Holy Spirit. I know that you, know you have a relationship with the Lord. How can you so easily be turned away from the truth? And that's the exhortation for each of us as individuals and for the church in America today. They knew the truth of justification by faith alone. They had been taught. But now, sadly, foolishly, they had been drawn away by the false teachers to another gospel. It said back in, in verse, in, I quoted this earlier, in chapter 1, verse 6, turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, having foolishly heeded the words of men over the word of God. People will quote you things and tell you they're from the Bible, and they're not. Can I get an amen to that? You know who's the worst? Politicians. They try to use the Bible. They should stop it if they don't know the author. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. And they'll misquote it and take it out of context, and it's so not. And they'll use it uh, to promote abortion. They'll try to use the word of God to promote lies, to promote uh, ungodly marriage, all of it. And the reason that they get away with it is because some people are biblically illiterate, and that's one of the biggest problems even in the church today. I, I talk to Christians all the time who've never read through the entire Bible. If you've been saved more than a year, you should have read through the whole Bible already. Can I get an amen to that? If God put a love letter, if he sent a love letter to your house, uh, I don't know, using a meteor and land in your backyard and it, on the top it had your name on it from God, open and read, would it take you 55 years to read it? Or would you open it up and read it? Would you turn the TV off and get rid of Netflix for a while and read the Word of God? Can I get an amen to that? And we live in a biblically illiterate society because we listen to the opinions of men and we fall for it because we haven't known the truth. Guys, to know this book better is to love God more. Because to know him is to love him. Can I get an amen to that? 
I think the depths of our love is really a lot of it is based upon our understanding of all that he has done for us and understanding who he is. And how do we fully understand that? We study his word. You won't know the full character of God if you don't know the full counsel of God. Amen? People understand part of who God is. Well, my God would never do that. You're right, because your God doesn't exist. Can I get an amen to that? People who've read two verses in the Bible, judge not lest she be judged. Every atheist knows that verse somehow. And they have these verses they pick, and then they'll say, my God would never do that. Well, they don't know God because they've never read the whole counsel of God. Can I encourage you? We have lists on the back table. Read through the Bible in a year. Guys, I'll tell you what, and it's okay to read less in a year. It's okay. You're actually allowed to do that. Can I get an amen to that? We desire the word of God more than our necessary food. Oh, foolish Galatians. He's telling them that you're, you've been lazy. You're, you have no spiritual discernment. You're mentally lazy. You're being entertained by everything else, and you're listening to the words of men. May we always view the words of men in light of the word of God. Amen? God's word is always the final court of authority. I have people send me stuff all the time. As soon as people find out you're a pastor, they, they love to. And I have, the, I have some people that are really liberal in their politics, and they write me like, well, Jesus, he would feed the poor. Yes, he would, but he wouldn't kill babies. Amen? And he wouldn't condone a marriage outside of a man and a woman because God created it. Can I get an amen to that? And you know what else? He'd have the Bible taught in schools and not ban it from schools. And he wouldn't ban the Word of God. He wouldn't ban the Ten Commandments. Can I get an amen to that? And he wouldn't promote... Uh, sexual perversion as acceptable behavior. Can I get an amen to that? Oh, but, but you know, you guys need to feed the poor more. I agree with that. Granted, we need to feed the poor more. Amen to that. Pure and father religion is to minister to the orphans and the widows. We need to do a better job of that. But let me just say, everything else that you're talking about are things that you guys stand for and need to stop all of it and repent. Amen? amen? Oh, foolish Galatians, you're listening to the words of men instead of listening to the word of God. You've been drawn away so quickly to another gospel. Look what it says there. Who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth. The word bewitched there has the idea of the Galatians are under some type of a spell. Now, not, not a spell literally, like a spell was cast upon them, but, but figuratively, that their thinking is so clouded and so unbiblical that it seems that some kind of spell has been cast over them. I don't understand when I meet Christians and they tell me things that are so contrary to the word of God and they act like God is okay with it. I don't get it. You need to remove the scales from your eyes. Amen? You've been letting the culture define Christ for you. The culture doesn't define Christ. Christ should define and, in fact, impact the culture. Amen? Trying to be culturally relevant. Another denomination voted to make, you know, take away all the masculine pronouns out of, out of the Bible because he's a holy parent because father, that's, that's gender. Oh, stop it! He made us male and female. Game over. Can I get an amen to that? My, my child's trying to figure out what gender they are. I can help you. Bring them to my house. I'll tell you in 30 seconds. We can fix this right now. If we make the word of God the standard, it's game over. Can I get an amen to that? You've been bewitched. And you know what? The church today is being bewitched. They'll get a book written by a man, and this is the thing that will change my life. Vitamins, meat and potatoes. Amen? A vitamin's okay if you've had a full portion of this. But if you eat only vitamins, you're going to starve to death. Can I get an amen to that? Yeah, you know, I'll be honest with you. Every time I start reading a book, and that's okay if you like to read books, God bless you, and that's fine. Every time I start reading a book, I'm like, oh, this is good, this is better. I can eat Pop-Tarts, but I have steak and potatoes over here. What? That's fine, but this is where I grow the most. Amen? Word of God. And it just breaks my heart. How easily the church can be witched today by the latest, the latest fad, the newest revelation, the influence of the culture, instead of holding firmly to the completed revelation of God's word and the simple truth of the gospel. He says there that you should not obey the truth. They turn away from the truth of the gospel to follow the lies of the enemy. You know that the way that our culture has been impacted is they get the lie into the school and then they teach our kids lies. They get to lie, you know, and a lot of schools have our kids, have more of an influence on our kids than we do because they get them seven, eight hours a day. By the time dad or mom gets home from work, we might get them a couple hours. And that's why it's so important that we, we, we need to train up our kids in the way that they should go, amen? So that when they're old, they will not depart from it. 
But they're taught a lie all day long, and if you turn on the news, it's all slanted. Nobody on the news has an agenda, do they? Are we not blown away when we see someone pray on TV? Are we not blown away when someone mentions Jesus' name? You know what? You go back 30 years and everybody prayed on TV. And they were all going to church. And, every sick, and now the Christians are portrayed as, as homophobic bigots who are idiots. And all the people that live ungodly lifestyles, are, they're promoted. And guys, you pour that, the, what we're entertained by is what we're going to become if we're not careful. Can I get an amen to that? And he's saying, look, you're, you're listening to a lie. You're not obeying the truth. You've been bewitched. You've got a spell cast on you in a sense that you're listening to this so long that you start to believe it. You know what? You can say two plus two is five 10 million times and it's still a lie. Amen? And you can try to change what the truth is, but the truth cannot be changed. By the way, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Amen? Oh, that's narrow. Praise God for a narrow way to, to heaven. Amen? I just want more choices. I want more choices. That just seems too narrow to me. The building's on fire. There's the door out. I don't know. I need some choices. <laughs> Amen? We're all headed to hell without Jesus. There's the road, the cross of Calvary. It's only through him that we can be saved. And I'm glad it's narrow. And I'm glad that there's one truth. Amen? Notice what it says here at the end of that verse. It says that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. Clearly portrayed. Publicly displayed. The word of God has been given to you. It's been clearly portrayed to you through the cross of Calvary. Paul wonders how the Galatians could have missed the message that had been made so clear to them. Their vision of Jesus Christ and Him crucified had become cloudy. Guys, we need to, you know why we take communion every month? You know why we worship the Lord all the time? You know why we need to be in the Word of God every day? And do you know why I love salvation messages? I'll listen to a gospel message 10 times a day for the rest of my life and it'll never grow common because I am so thankful for the cross of Calvary. The problem today is people are making the cross less. They're making what Jesus did less. And you make it less when you add to it. The cross plus our class. The cross plus membership in our church. The cross plus your first holy communion or your, or your first confession or your last... Right. Not Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. And when you cloud the cross, you're getting away from the simple truth of the gospel. They could no longer see him in his work on the cross as the center of their Christian lives, as a sufficient work necessary for salvation. Now it was Jesus plus circumcision, or Jesus plus the law, Jesus plus anything else is a false gospel. Amen? We're only adding a little bit. That's too much. A little bit's too much. I told you about... Pray for Ivan, the young man that came to my door, told me he was a theology student a couple weeks ago, and he started telling me, and boy, we were right on for a while. Now yeah, you're my brother, amen, amen. And you have to do Passover once a year. Uh, no, that's a false gospel. And you have to, you, you, you know, you have to worship only on Saturday, false gospel. And about three of those, I said, bro, let me explain something to you. You just went from being my brother to a false prophet. I really would just assume you leave the neighborhood. I'm going to pray for you. Can I get an amen to that? You, you went from someone who were walking together in Christ. When you add to the cross of, cross of Calvary, you're denying the cross of Calvary. You're denying the completed work of our Savior. Look what he says in verse 2. This I only want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing of faith? Let me guys ask you a question to that. Did you do so many good works that God said, wow, that person is so amazingly good, I'm just going to pour out the Holy Spirit on them now done so many good works, they've checked all the boxes, they've read through the Bible ten times, and, and they've studied the Greek and the Hebrew, and they're going door to door, and they're doing all these, oh, and they had the first Holy Communion, and they got circumcised, and they kept the law, and they did this, and so because they've done all that, now I'm going to give them my Holy Spirit. Or did the Holy Spirit come upon you because you came humble and broken before the Lord, and you cried out to Him, you believed in Him, you put your faith in Him, and then He poured out His Holy Spirit upon you. Which one is it? It's faith. And yet, sometimes we act like if I just work harder, if I just do more things, then somehow I'll be closer to God. Let me tell you, 
You put your faith in God. You be desperate for God. You seek God above all else. He pours out His Holy Spirit upon you. And now everything you do, you do in the power of the Holy Spirit. When, you, when you're outside of God's will, you're convicted. Amen? When you're persecuted for your faith, you're comforted. Guys, I want to walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Less of me and more of Him. Amen? And that's the exhortation here. Did Almighty God... By the way, did you know that the Holy Spirit says in Ephesians is our down payment on heaven? Isn't that good? It's our down payment on heaven. You believe, that's how you know you're going to heaven. You put faith in the Lord. And by the way, here's the Holy Spirit coming to live inside of you, seal, sealing you. It's, it's ownership papers that you've been redeemed, forgiven, adopted, accepted. You're going to heaven. Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Guys, we look around at the world and we, we say, why don't they get it? Well, you know why they don't get it? They don't have the Holy Spirit. Why, do they, why can they read a verse that makes so much sense and go, I don't, I don't understand that. You know what? Maybe some of you, before you got saved, you read the Bible and it was all Greek to you. Amen? And when you read it, you didn't understand it. And then the Holy Spirit came into your life and what happened? Now you read it and you can't get enough of it. Holy Spirit gives us understanding. Amen? A spirit of salvation, redemption, adoption came upon you because you were walk, not because you were walking in perfect obedience to the law of Moses, it was because you had freely given yourself in spite of your sinful past and your inability to keep the law. By, you put your faith in Jesus Christ. You recognize you're a sinner in desperate need of a Savior and you believed on the cross of Calvary. You believed on the name of Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 9, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be? Saved. You'll be saved. Redeemed. Saved from the judgment we all deserve. What a great and awesome God we serve. By placing your faith in Jesus Christ and His work of redemption on the cross, again, salvation is a free gift. It's not a paycheck. You know the gospel makes no demands except one, that you believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There it is. It doesn't say you believe on Jesus and, 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 and. But a lot of churches out there do that, don't they? A lot of people claiming to be Christians out there do that, don't they? Now I want to make this clear. Because this, this is the problem people have with this. Oh, so I just, I just believe in Jesus and then go live like the devil. You know, oh, if it's, all, if it's grace, then I can just, and, I, and I'm also tired here, I'm under grace, so it doesn't matter what I do. Let me tell you something, grace is freedom from sin, not freedom to sin. Can I get an amen to that? And as we walk in the holiness of the Lord, as we walk filled with the Holy Spirit, we want to obey Him. We want to honor Him. We want to serve Him. We want to glorify His name. We don't want to stumble other people. We don't want to be a poor testimony. We don't want to be walking hypocrites. Can I get an amen to that? Too often people think, they, which are, or do, you believe, do you believe in the law or, the, or grace? I believe in both. But the law can't save me. Can I get an amen to that? And the law doesn't sanctify me, but it shows me that I need to be saved. And I'm still called to live a holy and set-apart life but that's only possible as I surrender my life completely and fully to the Lord. There's nothing you can do because Jesus already did it. Can I get an amen to that? He already did it. Galatians had been saved by faith, not by works. And Paul now applies the same principle to living a sanctified life. Again, salvation, justification comes by faith. But so too, a life set apart to God and living a sanctified, be growing in the Lord comes by faith. You only grow closer to God by faith. You only become uh, more effective, for the, more useful to the kingdom of God by faith. You can only live a more holy life by faith. You can only have a life that produces great works by faith. As soon as you check faith at the door of justification and then you try to earn it through sanctification, you're, you're going to be miserable because you're going to do nothing but fail. Can I get an amen to that? You can't do it. I can't do it. Our faith and our hope is in our Savior. Look at what verse says in verse 3. Are you so foolish? Is he kind of making a point here? We're in three verses he said foolish twice. Amen? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Having begun in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit, are you try, trying now to perfect yourself in your own good works or by keeping the law? You understood when you came to the cross that I can't redeem myself. I can't forgive myself. There's nothing I can do to earn heaven. Again, if I could, there would be no need for the cross. Jesus in the garden said, if there be any other way, there is no other way. 
It's only through Jesus and his death on the cross. So why would we come to him humble and broken and desperate and recognize we're sinners in need of a Savior and believe on his name and confess his name and receive him as Savior and then leave him, set him aside and go try to become more like him in our own strength? Guys, we couldn't do anything until we got saved. Without him, we can do nothing, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen? Paul is blown away by their foolish thought process of the Galatian believers who having experienced salvation, forgiveness, redemption, and the powering of the Holy Spirit by grace through faith and belief in Jesus Christ are now attempting to perfect themselves through their own fleshly efforts. I'm going to do good works. The word there, perfect, in Greek means to, to bring to completion. Refers, the word flesh there refers to our old sinful nature. You, you're going to try to be made complete in Christ through your flesh? through your own good works? Are you so foolish to think that spiritual growth and maturity can be achieved through works of the flesh instead of simply putting your faith in Christ and abiding in Him? So one thing about having faith in Christ is it's not a momentary thing that we do. We are to abide in Him. Can we say amen to that? We abide. We dwell with Him. We don't pray a prayer, you know, at the Harvest Crusade or uh, somebody leads us in a prayer and then... Uh, you know, we live 10 more years of our life with nothing changing and think that we've been saved because we haven't. Because reality is, if we're truly saved, we will abide. We'll hunger for Him. Uh, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. You can't take the Holy Spirit with you back into your old life and not feel convicted. If there's no conviction, there's been no conversion. Can I get an amen to that? Some of you disagree, and that's okay. You're wrong, but some of you disagree. <laughs> because the reality is, the Holy Spirit's not going to live inside of you and not convict you of your sin, Amen. Praise, aren't you glad that the Lord convicts you? Those who the Lord loves, he, he disciplines. Amen? We need to be disciplined by God. He loves us. He, he corrects us. I'm thankful for his correction. Do you think you can perfect yourself? Do you think you can complete yourself? It says in Philippians 1, 6, this is my wife's favorite verse. Our, our, two, our two life verses are in the same chapter. It says, he who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. He's the one that began the work. He's the one still doing the work, and he'll be faithful to complete the work, and praise God for that. Can I say amen to that? And when we want to leave him out of the work, what a mistake that is. When we want to add to it and do it on our own, what a disaster that is. I'm thankful for this promise. How about you? I'm still a work in progress. How about you? He's still doing a work in us. He began the work as he saved us. He redeemed us. He adopted us. He forgave us. But he's still continuing to do work in us. He's justified us, now he's sanctifying us. Amen? And it's a work in progress. It's by grace through faith that we are saved. It is by grace through faith that we grow spiritually. Salvation isn't one process and growing spiritually another. It's the same thing. So the fruit of faith being empowered by the Holy Spirit to live a holy and set-apart life. It's been said a higher level of living does not bring the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit produces a higher level of living. I say amen to that. It's not me doing good works that produces a, a greater relationship with the Lord. It's a greater relationship with the Lord that produces great works. Under grace, we are blessed and grow spiritually by believing and receiving what God has for us. Legalism says we are blessed by earning and deserving. How about, I don't want what I deserve. How about you? What do we deserve? We deserve hellfire. I was just visiting this week, and now he's telling me I deserve hell. He hasn't even met me. I don't have to meet you. You're a sinner just like me. Can I get an amen to that? We all deserve hellfire. But it's by grace we've been saved, not of works. As any man should boast, and praise the Lord for that. Amen? And so this mentality, well, I'm so holy, I deserve. No, you're so unholy, you deserve. And praise God that by his grace, we don't have to go there if we put our faith in him. If we let him, you know, he died in our place so that we might be made whole. Praise God for his grace. Look what it says there in verse four. Have you suffered so many things in vain? If indeed it was in vain? The very Galatians had suffered great reproach and many afflictions and persecutions for the sake of the gospel and because of their the principles of faith that they put in Christ. Did they suffer in vain, having abandoned the simplicity of faith for the works of the law? What he's saying is, you stood for the gospel, and you had to suffer for it, and now you're abandoning the gospel to chase after something else that is of no value. Those who trust in the cross of Christ alone, Jesus plus nothing, will always be persecuted by those who add to the gospel. 
I get told so many times that I just don't get it. Are you, oh, well, yeah, well, you understand some of it, but let me explain it to you in a deeper way. And not that I can't grow spiritually, because I absolutely can, and not that I'm arrived and I never will till I get to heaven. How about you? I won't. I feel, I feel like I've been, I've been a pastor for thir- over 30 years, and I feel like I'm about ankle deep in the ocean in understanding. Can I get an amen to that? God's, I mean, I, I, I teach the same chapter 10 times in my lifetime, and the 10th time I teach it, I'm still learning, amen? Still growing. It's a constant thing of growing in the Lord, of being, becoming more like our Savior. But know that there will always be those who mock you when you just believe in the simplicity of the, of the gospel. Oh, there's a more excellent way. Oh, there's something else you need to do. Here's something else you need to do. And the legalists are always arrogant, and they almost always lack joy. Can I get an amen to that? You know why they don't have joy? Because they're trying to earn it. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is joy. Amen? I know who I am in Christ. And we can have joy. They mock you. They call you shallow because legalism always leads to arrogance and pride. They think they're more spiritual and more committed. The Bible tells us that those who are legalistic, it tells us if they believe in the works of the law, they're the weaker brother. And they think they're the more spiritual one because they're adding to the cross. You have a TV in your house? I thought you were saved. You watch football? Oh, that's pagan. What's wrong with you? You need to be delivered. I thought you were a Christian. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't watch football, but I'll tell you what, it doesn't change who I am in Christ. Can I give me men of that? That's my, my salvation isn't based on my good works. A sanctified walk can only come through the empowering work of the Holy Spirit. A sanctified walk doesn't come from you adding more rules to your life and trying to abide by them in your own strength. That's what... These guys knocking on your door, they're earning, they're trying to earn credit with God. A vast majority of them are not at your door because they love you. They're trying to, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses are trying to be one of the 144,000. You talk about a misunderstanding of Scripture. They'll come to my door, you're trying to be one of the 144,000. Well, what do you, how do you know about that? You know it's 12,000, each of the 12 tribes of Israel, and they're all virgins, so I see a wedding ring, so it's not you. <laughs> kind of get an amen to that. There's a misunderstanding of Scripture that causes people to go out and try to earn heaven. And Jesus Christ is the one who paid the price, and Jesus is the one who makes the rules. Paul points them to the presence of the Spirit and the works of the Spirit. Galatian believers could not look back at either the gift of the Spirit or the gifts of the Spirit and link them to keeping the law. The work of the Spirit is the fruit of faith. It's believing God, it's trusting God, it's seeking God. A faithful walk is an outpouring of intimacy with God, being filled with the Spirit, seeking first His kingdom and His righteousness, delighting yourself in the Lord. A verse that God's been burning on my heart as I studied this text is, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Guys, when we make God the priority and the passion of our life, it changes how we live. Can we get an amen to that? Empowering baptism, filling of the Holy Spirit is not a goal to be achieved, but a gift to be received. Struggling in your walk, the answer isn't trying harder, but it's more of Him and less of you. I must decrease that He might increase. His empowering presence uh, received by faith will cause you to desire and to do things according to His will. Please don't misunderstand this. When people ask me, they're trying to make a decision. I'll say, love God and do what you want. Here's the reality. The more we fall in love with the Lord, the more we want to do what He wants us to do. Can I get an amen to that? And what He calls us to do will always agree with the Word of God. That's the final court of authority. Verse 5. Therefore, He who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does He not do it by the works of the Lord or by the hearing of faith? These miracles that have taken place, these miraculous things you've seen that the Lord has done, did that happen because someone did a bunch of good works? Oh, oh, you trekked 500 miles here. Okay, I'll heal you. Oh, you, you crawled to Mecca on glass. Okay, I'll heal you. I think of the woman with the issue of blood. You guys remember that? she gone to every doctor. She tried everything. She heard Jesus was passing by. She got down on her hands and knees and said, if I can just touch his garment, I know that I'll be healed. That's called an act of faith. Can I get an amen to that? And she reached out, and when she touched his garment, people were pressing in on him, a crowd was pressing in on him, and he said, who touched me? He already knew he wanted to give her a chance to confess that she had done it, she said, it was me, and he turned around. Your faith has made you well. Guys, it's our faith. It's not our good works. Can I get an amen to that? And he's exhorting them that that's where the the miraculous comes from. It doesn't come from, well, God will do a miracle here because I'm so good. It's by grace that God does a miracle here even though we're not so good. Can I get an amen to that? 
by His grace. It is faith, not good works, that transforms the life of the believer. And there is no greater example of this than Abraham. Look at verse 11. Verse 6. I'm sorry, verse 6. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. Now, remember, he's talking to a group that is trying to get people to go back to the law. And they consider Abraham their father. Amen? And now he's letting them know that only those, what does it say, who are, are of, the, of faith are, son, are the true sons of Abraham. You're not a son of Abraham because of your genealogy. We're talking about spiritual sons. You know, when the Lord told Abraham he was going to be a father of many nations, and how did that happen? It happened by faith. Amen? Abraham was saved by faith when there was no law. There was no law, there was no law that he could keep. There was no list of rules that he could follow to earn heaven. He was saved by faith. He was saved by faith in the one who was coming, and he didn't even know who it was. Abraham's salvation was based on his faith in God, just as yours and I, ours is today, mine is today. We need to put to death the notion of different gods in the Old and the New Testament. I don't like that Old Testament God. He's kind of rough. Same God. Can I get an amen? He's a loving, gracious, merciful God, and he's also a God of righteous judgment. Amen? And if we read the whole counsel of God, it's the same God. If people say the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, there's a general misunderstanding. What God did in the Old Testament times is a different form of completely, of completely in their mind, foreign to the New Testament. And nothing could be further from the truth. There's a wonderful and de divine continuity between the two Testaments. If you've been coming on Thursday night, do we not see Jesus in every chapter? We see Jesus in every single chapter. Old Testament pictures of New Testament truth. Amen? And that's why I encourage you. The Old Testament rocks. Amen? I love the Old Testament. It's all pointing to the Lord. And Paul's going into the heritage of the Jews to Abraham to prove that God has not changed. Abraham was the father of the Jews. The Jews took great pride in being descended from Abraham. So Paul takes a look at Abraham and what he finds in this man. How was he saved? He wasn't saved by keeping the law. The law didn't exist. He was saved by grace through faith. There's nothing new under the sun. Can I get an amen to that? A man who's trying to be sanctified by grace through faith long before he ever did anything that might earn him God's favor. It says in Genesis 15, Abraham simply believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He believed in God. He put his faith in God. Guys, you want, you want your life to change? Put your faith in God. Amen? Believe in him. It was based on his faith in God, not his good works. His sin was paid for at the cross, just like yours and mine. But see, in the Old Testament, they were making sacrifices, pointing to the Messiah who was coming. But keep in mind, in the times of Abraham, I mean, he couldn't have fully grasped that the Messiah was coming, but he put his faith in the true and living God. And then God brought about salvation through Jesus Christ. You know, it's interesting. Where did the, where did the Old Testament saints go before Jesus went to the cross? Where did they go when they died? Who knows? Paradise. Paradise. It's also called what, Terry? Abraham's bosom. Abraham's, I knew Terry was going to know that because he reads his Bible. Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom is where it was a, you know, and here's a false teaching. Let me clarify. We, we probably won't get through the whole, just don't relax. You'll still be at brunch. Okay. But here's the reality. Before the cross, they were in paradise, but they were not in what we refer to today as heaven because Jesus had not died on the cross. And this is where some people get the concept of purgatory, which is not biblical. Can I get an amen to that? Now, it also talks about when Jesus died on the cross, he set the captives free. It's the people in paradise is part of that understanding. And, he, and people will say, well, Jesus had to go into hell like a wormy person and be born again. Stop it, and that's blasphemy, and don't do that. Can I get an amen to that? And all these naming and claiming, grabbing and blabbing people teach that same false doctrine. And he had to go in like a worm. He said it's finished. Can I get an amen to that? So he went into the presence of the Old Testament saints, if you will, and he ushered them. They now had the ability to be in the presence of the Father. Why? Because Jesus had paid the price. Again, they were waiting. So not, guys, there's no waiting space anymore, amen? They were already in the presence of God in a sense, but now you close your eyes on earth, you open them up in glory, there's no purgatory. You don't need to pray people onto the neck. You don't pray for dead people. They don't need prayer. It's too late, amen? If they're in heaven, 
Don't pray to them. They don't hear you. Can I get an amen to that? Pray for their family that needs Jesus. Amen? But here's this picture. And again, Father Abraham. And he's taking them back. You got to love Paul. He does not pull punches. Can I get an amen? Oh, you guys think you're super religious? How was Abraham saved? Was it by all his good works? Did he keep the law? Oh, yeah, that's right. The law didn't exist, and you know that. So how did he get saved? He got saved by faith. And guys, that's the only way you're going to get saved. And when you add to the cross of Calvary, you're denying that salvation comes through faith alone. Abraham, speaking of pictures of Christ in the Bible, one of the greatest acts of faith ever, in my mind, in the Bible, is Abraham preparing to offer his son Isaac. If you're a father, a parent, grandparent in here, can you imagine taking your son, your only son, the son of promise that God promised to you, and then carrying up a knife and wood, and your son's carrying the wood up. Your son, the son of Abraham, the son is carrying the wood up to Mount Moriah. Jesus Christ carried the cross. Amen? And the father was going to sacrifice his son, just as our heavenly father did sacrifice his son. And it was only when Abraham pulled back the knife and was ready to sacrifice his son. By the way, Isaac wasn't 10 or 12. He was probably closer to 30. I'm thinking maybe 33 would make sense. (laughs) How old was Jesus? I don't know that for sure, just Pastor Dave's opinion. But Isaac could have got up and left, and he didn't because he submitted to his father. And Jesus could have got off the cross, and he didn't because he was submitted to his father. Can I get an amen to that? And Abraham, by faith, was ready to sacrifice his son. And it's when he held up the knife that the Lord stopped him and said, Now I know. You put your faith in me. You put nothing in front of me, not even your own son. And then it said, God provided himself a sacrifice. A ram caught in a thicket. He doesn't say provided for himself. He provided himself a sacrifice. Does the Old Testament point to Jesus? Everything in it. And it's by that faith that Abraham believed. Salvation by faith, even before the law existed. Is that good stuff or what? Verse 7. Therefore, no that only those who are of the faith are sons of Abraham. The Judaizers thought they were the only true sons of Abraham. You Gentiles are Gentile dogs. You're not really sons of Abraham. But if we circumcise you and you keep some of the law, then you can be a pseudo son of Abraham. (laughs) And he's letting them know, you know who the sons of Abraham are? The people who put their faith in Jesus Christ. They're the sons of Abraham. Because Abraham is a man of faith in God, and those who are sons of Abraham are people that put their faith in God. Can we get an amen to that? Now, praise God for the for Jewish people, amen? We love the Jewish people. They're God's chosen people. God's not done with them yet. Thank you, Lord, amen? There's a reason we planted a church in Calabasas. This is one of the most Jewish communities in America. But the Judaizers thought they were the only sons of Abraham. The Judaizers taught that the Gentiles are sharing the promised blessing of Abraham. They had to first become like Abraham and his descendants, again, by being circumcised and keeping the law. Since Abraham is made righteous by faith and not by works, Abraham is the father of everyone who believes in God and is accounted righteousness. What a rebuke this was to these Judaizers who tried to bring Gentile Christians under the law. They believed they were superior because they were descended from Abraham and observed the law. By the way, God has no grandchildren. Well, my, oh, you're a pastor. Well, my great uncle was a missionary. Praise the Lord. That's amazing. For him. <laughs> What's that got to do with you? We don't go to heaven because our parents are saved. My dad was a pastor for 60 years, and I praise God for it. I'm so blessed that I got to grow up in his house. I'm so thankful I got to be Johnny Johnston's son because I saw the most godly man I've ever met. I lived with him every day. I got to sit in the front row of what it looked like to, to love and serve your wife and lead your kids spiritually, and I'm so thankful for him. But you know what? I'm not saved because he, uh, he was saved. I'm only saved because I gave my life to Jesus Christ after recognizing my own sin and my own desperate need for a Savior. So if you're here and you think, well, my parents, my family, my family has faith, that's not going to get it. You need to have your own faith in the Lord. Amen? Paul says the most important link to Abraham is not the link of genetics, but it's the link of faith. That's why he's our father. In a sense, he's our father Abraham, if you will. Uh, Our ultimate father, of course, is in heaven. Amen? Let's just finish through verse 9. Don't panic. Verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, Preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. Scripture. And the scripture. You'll see Paul a lot referring to scripture. You know the best 
Commentary on the Bible? The Bible. Not quoting what some man said. Well, so-and-so said, and so-and-so said, and so-and-so. And a quote from another believer is okay. But you know what? That's not how we confirm what the Word of God is teaching. It doesn't come from the quotes of men. It comes from the Word of God. And Paul is constantly taking them to the scripture. While our personal testimonies are fine, it is ultimately God's word that transforms life. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. For seeing the scriptures being the word of all, the all-knowing God foresaw the future as they were still prophetically, uh, it's still prophetically due today, that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Again, the word of God preaches the gospel of grace in direct contrast to the false gospel of works being preached by the Judaizers. They're preaching another gospel. If you add to the cross of Calvary, you are preaching a false gospel. Preach the gospel of Abraham. Guys, the gospel is in the Old Testament. It's not a New Testament addition or change. It's the same gospel that's always been the gospel. It was always pointing to Christ. Every lamb that was slain was pointing to the Savior. Every sacrifice that was made, every feast of the Old Testament, the Passover, the blood of the Lamb in the shape of a cross, the angel passed over, it's always pointed to Jesus, always, always, always. None of it points to Muhammad. None of it points to Buddha. None of it points to the, the 30 million gods of Hinduism. None of it points to Joseph Smith. Amen? It all points to Jesus. And he's the only answer. And he's our only hope. More than just a, a verbal consent, there needs to be inward belief. It says that there that Abraham and all the, all the nations shall be blessed through Abraham. You know what the greatest blessing that came through Abraham? What, how, what was the greatest blessing that came through Abraham? You said it. Don't be shy. Jesus? Jesus! <laughs> Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It's through his line that Jesus came. Can I get an amen to that? So the ultimate reason why all the nations have been impacted by Abraham, well, of course, is example of faith, etc. But the real truth is it's because of Jesus. True faith like Abraham's is more than just a verbal consent or inward belief. It should impact our actions. And again, Abraham on Mount Moriah showed that he really put his faith in Jesus when he took his son to be sacrificed. Can I get an amen to that? It also says that Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. There's many times. And there were, now, Father Abraham who had faith, did he, always show, did he also show some times where he didn't have faith? Can I get an amen to that? Hagar! I'm going to give your wife a son. It's been a while, Lord. And his wife comes in. Maybe it's to my pretty young maidservant. Okay. No argument. That was faithless. Can I get an amen to that? Aren't you glad that even though we've been faithless, God still sees us as perfect and holy and righteous and just through the faith we placed in Him? Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Last verse. So then those who are of the faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Those who are of the faith are blessed. I love the word blessed. Don't you love the word blessed? And by the way, have you ever noticed that not very many unbelievers ever use that word? I was on the phone the other day with a coworker getting some help. She's in Dallas, Texas. And she said something. And I said, man, you guys are always so great. You're always so helpful. I really appreciate it. And I said, you know, who's your manager? I want to let him know what a great job you're doing. And she said, and she goes, well, darling, that would be a blessing. I said, blessing? Does that mean something to you? She says, oh, it means everything to me. I said, why are you blessed? She said, because Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And I said, amen to that. I think she might be watching right now. Hey. I sent her a link to our website. We're talking about Jesus for 20 minutes. No one's blessed but those who know the Savior. No one's really blessed. When you drive by someone's big house and you say they're blessed, I don't know about that. That's temporary. What we have is eternal. Amen? The relationship we have with the Lord is going to outlast this lifetime. It's all chaff. It's all wood, hay, and stubble. It's all going to burn. Can I get an amen to that? And too often we equate blessing to stuff when you know what? You can have everything the world has. What does a profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Praise the Lord for the blessings that we have in Christ. You know what a blessing is? It's not getting what I deserve, but it's by God's grace. The ultimate blessing that we share with Abraham is we are in a right standing before God. Isn't that good to know 
that he knows you best, he loves you most, and in spite of everything you've ever done, he's forgiven you, he's washed you white as snow, he's made you holy, and you stand righteous before him even though you don't deserve it. Guys, it doesn't get any better than that. Can I get an amen? amen. Why would we want to try to earn it when we've already got it? Can I get an amen? So the good thing about teaching verse by verse, we'll stop right there. But you know what? By faith or by works, look at the fruits of faith, the empowering of the Holy Spirit, the miraculous works among us, salvation, even before the law existed, we saw that with Abraham. We see the good works that should come out of our lives after we've been saved. And then we have the blessing of God. The Lord, God blesses you. The Lord loves you. He's adopted you into his family. What a great and awesome God we serve. Amen? Amen? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your love and your grace and your infinite mercy. And Lord, may we never take the grace of God for granted. May we never take your grace for granted. May we never take the work of salvation on the cross of Calvary. May we never try to add to the work you finished on the cross for us. We thank you that we've been adopted into your family. We're new creations in Christ. We have the promise of eternal life. You filled us with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. We can't thank you enough. We can't praise you enough. We can't worship you enough. Lord, I pray there's anybody here today that doesn't know you, that today would be the day of salvation. You're here this morning, and maybe you've never given your life to the Lord. Maybe you've been trying to earn it your own way. Maybe you felt you're unworthy of it because your life's such a mess. Well, guess what? That's true of all of us. We're not worthy of it, but worthy is the lamb that was slain to pay the price that we might have eternal life. As I quoted earlier, it says in Romans 10, 9, if you confess confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. Jesus said, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Guys, it's an act of belief. It's an act of faith. Saying, yes, I believe what Jesus did on the cross that he did for me. I believe that he loves me. I believe that he died for me. And I'm ready to surrender my life to him. Belief brings salvation. If you're here this morning, you believe. You've been convicted by the Holy Spirit. He's drawing you into himself. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. I'm going to ask you to do something really simple right now. Not join a church, but just say openly, I, I want to confess him as my Savior. I believe in him. I want to be my sins forgiven. I want to know that I have the promise of eternal life. If that's your desire this morning, why don't you just raise your hand and I'll pray with you right now. And you'll know before you leave here today that you have the promise of eternal life. Anybody at all. You know that most people are already saved in here and that's a wonderful thing. It would break my heart that even one person here would spend eternity separated from God. Anybody at all. Lord, we thank you for your love, your grace, your infinite mercy. We thank you, Lord, that it's by faith that we have been saved, not of works, lest any man should boast. We ask these things in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. is he worthy to be worshipped? Yes, Let's worship him.